Hello guys and welcome back to another long overdue episode of Sam's Motor and Machine. As you guys will see, I'm no longer in Ireland at the moment, I'm back in my home county of Kent in England. Just temporarily at the moment, I'm visiting family, but it does mean that I've got the use of this awesome workshop that my brother and I built a few years ago. In fact, it's more than a few years ago now. Now hopefully you guys have had a good Christmas and New Year's and you're ready to jump back into some in-depth Land Rover, Range Rover videos, because that's what I've got lined up for you guys over the next few days and weeks. Now over the last few months I've had a lot of ideas building up and jobs that need doing on the Range Rover that I haven't had a chance to do yet. So I'm taking this time while I've got a few days at home here without much going on to knock out a load of these jobs, record them all for you guys and make some cool content. So you'll see I've got some of the stuff that I'm planning to do over the next few days laid out in front of me here. I've been building up boxes and uh, the postman absolutely hates me. However, before we can get to any of this cool, exciting stuff here, there are some mechanical issues with the Range Rover that I need to sort out that become rather pressing in the last few weeks. As some of you guys might remember who've been around the channel for a bit longer, one of the first jobs I did on the L322 was replace the alternator. Now the alternator was the first failure I had on the Range Rover and actually to date it's the first breakdown I've actually had in the car, um, although it did get me home. So when the alternator failed, I actually replaced the belt, the auxiliary drive belt, and all of the pulleys and the tensioner at the same time, because when you have it all apart, it's always a good idea to do that. However, recently, just this winter actually, I've had a problem with the belt starting to slip, um, only usually in cold weather and when the engine itself is cold as well, so from cold starts. But it's not the normal kind of light squeaking noises that you get from the belt system on the 4.4 TDV8. It's a much louder screech which indicates the belt is actually slipping properly so um, yeah that's not good. Now I'm not entirely sure what could be causing that, it could be that the belt itself is stretched and that the tensioner is all the way out and it can't tension it anymore. It could be that the bearing on the tensioner has failed or one of the other uh, pulleys under there, one of the idlers, um, that might have failed and caused the belt to be running at an angle or it could be something else entirely. And unfortunately, with how congested the engine bay is on the 4.4 TDV8, it's very difficult to actually see what's going on down there just from looking above. So we're gonna to have to unfortunately strip it down again. Now this isn't so bad because I have done it before, you guys will be able to see on my YouTube channel. There's a, there's a couple of videos where I replaced the alternator. So I'll actually be referring back to my own videos to remind myself how I did it the first time around. But luckily this time we actually have the use of the pit as well. So that should speed things along a little bit. Additionally, whilst I'm doing this work, I also wanna strip out the donut on top of the engine, the in intake donut, and give all that a very good clean out because it's very likely this car being on uh, well over 200,000 miles now, that's gonna be completely caked with black soot and oil deposits that have been deposited over the last 200,000 miles. So I wanna get all that cleaned out, rebuilt, and then put back together again with a new belt, and hopefully that'll be a nice, clean, quiet running TDV8 again. So here lies the beast under the bonnet. Uh, the mighty 4.4 TDV8, and I absolutely love this engine. Um, it's done me very, very well over the last 30,000 miles. But you might be able to see an issue straight away if you know these engines quite well that I need to solve in this video as part of this process. So if you look around this intake elbow here, which is connected to the intercooler, this is where the charged air comes in from the turbo after it's been cooled into the intake donut, which then feeds into the inlet manifolds and down into the engine. So all around this elbow here, where this joins onto the uh, butterfly valve here, you can see black oozy gunge all around it, which indicates there's been a boost leak here, which has been allowing oil, which is always in the uh, charged air, to seep out of the, of the system and then basically cover everything in the engine bay. So that's not good, and this is something I'm definitely gonna be trying to solve in this video. And then a bit further back from the elbow here, you can see the EGR inlet here, which comes into the inlet manifold. Um, at the bottom of this is also very, very gungy, and oily as well so it looks like this might possibly also have been letting um, oil seep out but anyway from memory one of the first things we need to do is get the air boxes out to give ourselves some extra room and then we'll start stripping everything else down and get that fan out so we can have a look at the belts let's crack on <laughs> Thank you. 
you guys can see that. There's a fair bit of oil on here. Um, and on this subframe here, which looks like it's coming from the top of the bell housing. So I've got a good idea what that might be. But that's definitely another thing we're gonna have to look at on our uh, schedule of works we've got going on here. Hmm, good thing I'm doing this. Last time I did this, I think I made it a bit easier on myself by making sure all of the hose clamps are kind of facing the right way, I'm facing down towards me, as opposed to uh, up in the air like they were before. So and around the side up here as well, there's also you know, a couple of clamps that need to come off. So if you guys can see that, I'll just take another one of the hoses off of the turbo changeover valve. You can see this horrible brown emulsified oil um, leaking out of it, which is really not very nice. So the only thing I can think is that, that doing short journeys in the winter, which I have been doing fairly short journeys, um, has caused a fair bit of condensation to build up in the system as well, in the charge air, um, and mixed with that oil that's, that's always in the system. Um, so yeah, made this lovely gooey mess. So that's going to be a good bit of cleaning to do once we get it out. Once again, got the turbo bypass valve out of the truck. And as you guys saw when I was removing it then, there's definitely a lot more fluid, liquid in it than there was last time. There was some oil the first time I took this out. And this time it looks a lot more watery, like it's had uh, water mixed in with that oil, um, which is a little bit concerning to see at first glance. But now I'm just thinking about it, it kind of makes a fair bit of sense. So when I first bought this car, it was already on 189,000 miles. And I know that for a fact that the previous owner, basically all they did was drive it from Sussex all the way up to Edinburgh and back once a week. So that, that accounts for the, the high mileage on the car. But that kind of driving, nice long drives, getting up to high speed and getting everything nice and warm is also really good for diesels. Um, it means that things like this, condensation, don't really happen because everything has a chance to get, to get up to full operating temperature and dry itself out as you drive. However, since I took over the L322 in 2020, uh, I've done a lot more short journeys than I reckon the last owner did. Um, I still do a fair bit of uh, motorway mileage as well, then at least five days a week I'm doing short journeys in the, in the Range Rover as well, um, less than 15 minutes a lot of the time. So I think that that in combination with the fact that I'm now living in a very humid, wet environment in Ireland um, has contributed to a lot more condensation building up in the uh, um, charge air system. So yeah, not very good, but I think it's to be expected really. But thankfully the uh, Boost actuator is still working nice and free. I did grease this up with copper grease last time I took it out, um, so that's still working nicely. As this is a common problem on the 4.4 TDV8, if this seizes up, it causes a restricted performance error on the dash. So yeah, that's good. We will give this a full clean up and another re-grease before it goes back in. As you may have guessed, this video is once again sponsored by Autodoc, which I'm really thankful for. And I just want to take a minute to show you why you should be using Autodoc for your car parts too. If we load up the Autodoc app here, all you have to do is pop in your reg number and it'll only show you parts and accessories that fit your specific car. Once you've done that, you'll see there's a huge range of options to choose from for pretty much any part. For example, here on the P38, if I head into brake calipers, you'll see it asks me which caliper I need, front, rear, left or right. And then once I've selected that, it'll give me specific parts to suit. Another thing I love about the Autodoc app is this video section. These are generic tutorial videos, but they're actually really handy and quick to get to the point, like this EGR cleaning one here. So go try out the app and don't forget you can use the code SAM to get 5% off your order. So now that's out, I'm gonna head back underneath again and I'm gonna start taking out as many of the uh, radiator shroud, or fan shroud fixings as I can from underneath, and then we'll come back up the top again and then we'll start doing the same, same again on the top. So I think that's all the screws that I can get to from underneath, I'm done. I'm actually surprised I put as many back in as I did because it's a real pain in the ass to get to some of those, even with the valve and everything taken out. But anyway, now we can start working on the top half. So obviously this boost hose has got to come off. We have to drain some coolant as well, like we did last time because this pipe's in the way. Um, the air conditioning pipe, if you do it by the book, that also has to be disconnected. But as we've done before, you can actually just disconnect these two clamps holding it 
and then you can move it out of the way enough to get the fan and the cow out. So just a light coating in there, which is what you expect to see. <coughs> So here's our elbow. You guys can see just how much caked on crap there is on the outside of this, which is all because it's been blowing uh, charge air out of the system. And the reason for that is this green Viton seal that you guys can see on the inside. Now, unfortunately, this seal you cannot buy separately from Land Rover, the parch doesn't exist. The only way you can get this replaced is to replace the whole elbow and the pipe as well as one unit. And if and checking the part number online, that comes up as about 150 quid part. So that's something I'd rather avoid if I can. And you'll see exactly how I solved this boost leak later on in the video. So now I'm pretty sure we're at the stage where we're more or less ready for the fan and the cow to come out again. Um, now this is what really slowed me down last time I did this job. If you remember, I actually made a spanner out of an old, a huge old uh, imperial spanner. I drilled a hole in it and cut the tips off of the, um, the spanner end to make a tool to try and counter hold it whilst I undid the viscous fan coupling. It just about worked, but it took me ages. It was really, really fiddly and I got lots of grazed knuckles from it, so it wasn't really worth it. Um, but this time, I'm a bit better prepared. I've got myself a pair of Land Rover equivalent special tools for doing the fan hub, um, particularly on this car. And I think this is for the TDV6 as well. Um, should work for the 3.6 as well, TDV8. Uh, basically, this one's for the fan hub itself, and this one is to counter hold the pulley. And they're nice and long and nice and strong, and I should be able to hopefully get them down there and crack it off nice and easily. And if you're wondering, they're equivalent to Land Rover tools 303-1143 and 303-1142. So yeah, I got these off Amazon for about 28 quid, which is well worth it um, and much cheaper than the Land Rover price. Um, so if that's still available, I'll leave a link down below for you guys to go and check out. There we go. That was way easier than last time. So these are definitely going to be a tool that stays in my toolbox from now on. That was way easier. There we go. Finally free. So we're going to continue stripping this down a bit more. We're going to take out this uh, coolant pipe, which goes down in front of the alternator and, and one of the other pulleys. Get that out of the way so we can have a proper look at all of the pulleys. And then I'll probably take the belt off and have a feel of all those pulleys and just check and see if there's anything wrong with anything. A bit of a weird view I'll give you guys there, but I'm just going to see if I can get the belt out. I'm going to take a quick picture just to make sure I can remember which way it goes on. Now I can look this up, but I find it always easier to uh, work from a picture that I've taken. Okay. Okay, that's that old belt. <coughs> so here's the belt I've just taken off. And initially, as I said there, I thought it would look like it was wearing on the back of the belt as opposed to the, the front. But looking at it now, just having a look and you can still see quite a lot of the uh, original gates uh, logos on the back. I mean, it's not like brand new, obviously, but you can still see they're there, so it's not worn that much. But, but then it's kind of difficult to show it, but if you look, I'll zoom the camera in a bit as well. If you look kind of across the belt like that, you can see that this side has got more meat. You can see that this side has got more meat to it and this rib has actually worn down and become narrower. So the belt's actually wearing from this side first. Um, it's chewing up, it's chewing up this edge of the belt all the way around. Um, it's more, more noticeable in some areas than others, but here I think you can particularly see 
Uh, it's kind of feathered on the edge here on the inside. Um, and yeah, just, just this, this outer rib, just a lot narrower than the others. So um, hopefully that's coming across on camera, but that looks like what's happening there. And then here's another brand new belt. This is a Deco one. Um, and if we look at this in comparison, you can see there's a lot more meat across all of those ribs. So yeah, it has it has worn it quite considerably. If I stretch that out open there, you can see it's really quite thin. So yeah, this belt wasn't wasn't long for this world. It was going to be shredding pretty soon if I hadn't taken it off when I did. You can see in there. But yeah, two and a half years and about twenty five thousand miles. It shouldn't have done that really. So I'm thinking there's going to be either a misalignment somewhere from one of the pulleys or possibly a bad bearing. But we'll have to have a look. So I've been playing around in here with my straight edge, trying to figure out if any of these pulleys are out of line. And it's quite difficult to do with this to uh, to, to really check, but um, but it seems like all the idlers at least are pretty much in line, um, as good as you can hope anyway. Um, so I've been having a look down here at the pulleys and trying to figure out if there's anything wrong with them. And so far it seems like everything's okay with the uh, idlers and the tensioner. Um, all the bearings seem fine and everything as far as I can tell, seems to be where it should be. However, with all that debris from the belt around the alternator, that's strongly suggesting to me that the alternator pulley is not in line. So it's possible that when I replaced the alternator a couple of years ago, it didn't quite line up, and it wouldn't take that much misalignment to do that kind of damage to the belt over 25,000, 30,000 miles. Now, the reason I pulled it out is because I really want to check the orientation of the cables, the big heavy cable behind it, um, obviously the battery cable, and the... Uh, multi-plug connector on the back just to make sure they're not pushing up against the bracketry at the back where the alternator pushes in and you know keeping it away from where it should be I may regret taking this off because i know it's a bit of a bastard to get back into position again but um yeah i just wanted to really check that so let's see if we can get the get a look at the connections on the back and obviously the only one that i'm really interested in is the big um, positive power connection here because of how heavy that cable is and thick um, it would definitely have the potential to push against the back of the alternator and prevent it from sitting correctly so that's the one that I'm kind of interested in really so you guys saw me take the alternator off there and I've just refitted it again and made sure it's gone back into the position where it should be and as far as I can tell it's exactly where it should be and there's nothing binding on it or holding it away from the position it, sh it needs to sit in um, and the pulley, as far as I can tell, is square with all the other ones as well. And I've just checked with the straight edge. Again, that pulley is completely straight and flush with all the other pulleys on that side of the engine. So, um, so as far as I can tell, everything is fine with the pulleys and drive wheels on the front of the engine. Next, I'm going to start disassembling the intake donut for deep cleaning. And as you can see, like all of these engines, the intake donut is absolutely caked in thick death gunge. I'd say the layer is a good half inch thick all the way around, and it has the consistency of a soft baked chocolate brownie. A slight crust with a thick goo underneath. Nice. In the absence of a proper parts cleaner big enough, I used an old storage box and some diesel that I salvaged from an old fuel tank as my cleaning agent. Diesel works really well for breaking down oily carbon -y deposits and it's usually a lot cheaper than proper degreasers. So as you guys saw yesterday I put this inlet manifold in here with a load of diesel that we had which has been sitting around for ages. Um, we're never going to use it in a vehicle so it's actually quite a good degreaser and cleaner. So I've left this soaking in here overnight and obviously 
it's not quite deep enough to soak the whole thing. So I'm gonna turn it over now. And whilst the other side soaks, I'm gonna start scrubbing at the uh, side that's been soaking. So uh, as you can see, I've got my correct PPE on. I've got my very serious uh, work gloves on for this job because it's diesel and horrible uh, carbon stuff. So um, yeah, probably don't want too much of that on my hands. <coughs> and hopefully, diesel has done its work and turned all this just to sludge, this sludge just to uh, loose. And yeah, it does come off fairly easily by hand, so start scrubbing, I guess. So as you guys hopefully saw there, absolutely horrible job trying to clean out this uh, donut inlet manifold. Uh, it's really not a very nice shape to try and get around, and make sure you get everything out. Um, that's where these kind of wire brush pipe cleaner type jobs came in really handy. Um, I got these off Amazon uh, and I'll leave a link down below. But basically, you know, the only way you can get some of these inside faces inside this tube is with something like this. Now I'll try and show you inside this thing. It's not what you'd call clean enough to eat your dinner off, like we like to say in the UK, but it's definitely a lot cleaner than it was. Um, it's almost perfect, and by the time I've given it going over with this from brake cleaner in a minute to get all the diesel residue off, it should be pretty much bang on. It's also literally about half the weight it was when I took it off, so that just shows you how much residue there was inside this thing. So yeah, let's get it sprayed off with some brake clean, clean up this mess that I've made, and then we'll start throwing it back onto the truck. inside these inlet manifold openings and I really wish I hadn't because inside there it's just as bad if not worse than inside the inlet plenum the donut was. Um, the inside of both of these inlet manifolds is absolutely caked with that black thick gungy horrible mess um, but unfortunately on the 4.4 TDV8 taking those inlet manifolds off is a huge job which involves basically removing the engine from the car. You basically have to remove the engine from the car in order to get the injectors out, the fuel injectors 
in order to get the inlet manifolds off. And as much as I'd absolutely love to get all that horrible gungy mess out of the inlet manifolds of this engine, it's not a job that I'm prepared to do right now. I do keep saying it, but at some point in the future, I'm gonna take this car off the road and give the engine a proper going over. That'll include new timing chains and all the timing chain gear, proper inlet manifold clean. I might even replace the inlet manifolds, to be honest, because you know, prematurely, as they do crack on these cars, um, and everything else it needs doing. This work that I'm doing now really is kind of just an interim service before I can actually get the time to do the full in-depth rebuild, basically, of this engine. Um, but yeah, all of that horrible black gungy mess is to be expected on these 4.4 TDVAs and probably the 3.6s as well. And the cause of that horrible oily black carbon is really a combination of a couple of things, really. You've got the exhaust coming in from this pipe here, which is where all that carbon comes from, all that soot, because it comes on the TDV8 from before the DPF. And at the same time, you've got oil coming into the system as well by, via the PCV and the turbos as well. And both of those factors get worse over time as the engine wears. This engine, having done well over 200,000 miles, is bound to have a lot more crankcase ventilation oil coming into the system than a much younger engine. The turbos themselves are probably quite worn out. There's oil going to be passing from them as well. Now this will happen on diesel engines like this of any kind of age and mileage, but as they get older and more higher mileage like this one, um, those symptoms just get worse and worse and worse. And obviously this black contamination builds up over time. Um, the more miles you do basically, the more black gunge you're gonna have in your engine. On the positive side though, I recently had this engine remapped and as part of that process, they turned off the EGR. So the EGR gases that would have been flowing through this pipe won't be anymore. So we won't be getting any more of that soot going into the inlet. Um, we, will, we will still be getting oil, but oil on its own is not really that much of a problem. Um, it will build up slowly over time, but um, but yeah, on its own, it won't it won't create anywhere near as much of a mess as with it when it's combined with that EGR soot as well. So um, so now that I've actually cleaned out that inlet donut, it should stay a lot cleaner um, now that the EGR has been blanked. And as I said, in the future, when we do get a chance to give this engine a full going over that it deserves, these will all be clean as well, and we'll have a lovely clean inlet manifold system all the way through. But anyway, right now we're going to start reassembling the front of the engine and that means putting the belt back on again, so let's crack on with that.
So right at the start of this process, I said to you guys, one of the problems I was going to be looking to fix during this process was this leaking boost elbow here. So basically where this green seal joins onto the uh, throttle body here, where you've got the throttle plate, um, that's no longer sealing properly and it's allowing a little bit of boost to come out and with it bring a little bit of oil as well. Now this is a really common problem if you search around on the forums, lots of people have this issue and lots of people like me don't want to shell out 150 quid for a new part just because this seal isn't working properly. So people on the forums have been looking around for a suitable o-ring replacement uh, for this and unfortunately they haven't been able to do that however one of the fixes that i found that did seem to have had some positive results involves the use of these standard uh, 75 by three millimeter rubber o-rings now the fix that i'm talking about that i found online basically suggests taking three of these 75 mil o-rings and pushing them over the end of this uh, throttle body aluminium thr throttle body here and then when you come along and push your boost elbow back on again it squashes them up and creates a nice seal so i'm not committed to this but i'm going to give it a try first of all and just see how it works and first of all check i can actually get this back on again with these o-rings installed Okay, now let's see if I can actually get this back on again. Okay, so it does actually squeeze up. So to make sure I can get it up far enough that this clip can go back into position. It's not far off actually. So there you go, that took some effort to get back into place, as you can tell by my out of breathness, but that is actually locked in position much more tightly now. <coughs> so those O-rings inside are now squashed up against that uh, beveled edge that you've got on the front of this uh, throttle body housing, creating a nice tight seal. Now, part of me did think that they may have made it a floppy fit in the first place on purpose by design, um, just to give some compliance between the engine and the fixed radiator pack. However, you have still got a rubber boost hose here. So it's not like this is directly coupled with anything that is uh, in a fixed position. However, I'm willing to be the guinea pig on this, so I'll let you guys know if it causes any problems, but I think it should be absolutely fine. So that's the TV8 all put back together again. I feel like I'm getting pretty good at this uh, reassembly process of the old 4.4 TDV8, done it a couple of times now. And although it is a pretty scary looking engine bay at first glance, it does go back together all right once you know the general sequence of how things work, same as anything really. So obviously during that process we did lose a little bit of coolant, so I'm going to mix some of this uh, Comma Extreme G30 up to a 50-50 mix, and then we're going to chuck it into the header tank and we'll go through the partial uh, bleeding process of the 4.4 TDV8, which I'll show you guys as well. So we're pretty much ready for startup now. Um, I've obviously still got to do the oil and the oil filter, but I want to get the engine warmed up first before we do that. Um, I also want to make sure there's no leaks with anything that we've done so far. So I'm going to leave the engine cover off, um, do one final check around, reconnect the battery, top up the header tank to nearly the top. Then I'm going to crack this little bleed screw here on top of this return hose, start the engine, put the heating on full blast, and it should bleed itself up more or less. So let's see how we get on. Just so want to make sure obviously there's nothing that you've left in the way of the fan, no cables, make sure there's no cables and pipes and stuff where they shouldn't be. <clears throat> no loose ends, nothing disconnected still. I'm fairly confident, but it's always good to check. Stop the set of tank up a bit. See some air come, here's some air coming out straight away. Okay, and we'll go for a crank.
I'm going to mix up a little bit more coolant whilst that's idling. That's the sound of a pretty happy TDV8. We're just using the IID tool to monitor the uh, cooling temperature and the engine oil temperature while she idles away. Uh, it's a more accurate way than just um, looking at the, the, the gauge on the dash. Uh, so we've currently got 72 on the coolant and 59 on the oil. And I'll probably wait until the oil gets to about at least 65, 70 degrees before I want to drain it. So it might take a while. So I'm pretty happy with that. It's all sounding and looking very good and it's come up to temperature nicely and it's staying there, which is good. Excuse me while the TDV8 just beeps its way to, to quietness and I've just turned it off. I believe that's the uh, throttle plate that does that. <coughs> there we go. So in terms of the oil that I'm putting back in, I'm going for something a little bit different this time. And before you all jump into the comments to tell me how wrong I am to be using this grade of oil, please let me explain my position before we get to that point. So recently in my top five mods video, and I'll put a link up here if you guys haven't seen it, I was explaining that I've made some modifications to the way that the TDV8 works, uh, but I was kind of being a little bit cagey about the exact details of that. But what I was kind of alluding to without actually saying it is that I've actually had the DPF fixed on this car, and that goes for the EGR as well, that's fixed as well. So suffice to say that the way the TDV8 is running now is a little bit different than the way Land Rover initially intended. So the spec of oil that Land Rover recommends for this engine is handily on the uh, filler cap here and it is Castrol 5W30. Now 5W30 is a pretty thin grade of oil as far as, far as they go it's actually, and it's actually classed as a low viscosity oil. The other part of the spec that Land Rover specified for this engine is C1. However, that C1 classification is actually obsolete now and it's been replaced by C2 and C3. But what that C classification is for is for vehicles equipped with DPFs and SCRs. And the reason they have to have different grade of oil is that the oil has to be low SAPS or low SAPS. SAPS is an acronym and it stands for sulfated ash, phosphorus and sulfur. And basically it's a good thing to have in your oil ordinarily. And SAPS is actually put into the engine oil on purpose to, to maintain the TBN, the total base number, to resist viscosity shear loss and thermal breakdown, as well as protect against oxidization, wear, corrosion, and deposit formation, all of which would be very bad things to happen in your engine. Um, so saps are a good thing to have. However, before you rush out and go and buy some full SAPS oil, if you've got a DPF equipped vehicle, you can't do that because saps is very bad for DPFs. Hence the reason Land Rover had to spec a low saps oil for 4.4 TDV8. Hope you guys are with me. So now that my 4.4 TDV is uh, no longer troubled by that issue, let's say, I can go out and buy myself some A4 B3 oil like this, which has got full SAPS content, which is gonna help protect the engine and have all those good benefits that I just mentioned there. The other thing you'll notice about this ELF oil, which is actually Total, that's their brand for engine oil, is that it's 5W40. Now this, now this argument of whether we should be putting 5W30 or 5W40 or even 20W50 into our TDV6s and our TDV8s has been a subject of much debate over the last few years. There's actually a big YouTube channel which you guys have probably been watching as well. We've done a lot of work and a lot of discussions into this uh, subject. But my opinion is that 5W30 oil is spec by manufacturers mainly for reasons of efficiency. They're, they're not really that bothered if your engine lasts more than 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 miles. To be honest, as long as it gets out of the warranty period, most manufacturers are going to be pretty happy with that. So if they can make your engine do one mile per gallon more and emit 20 grams less of CO2 per kilometer by just reducing the thickness of the oil, I think that's probably what they did. And as well as that, the 4.4 TDV8 here has done nearly 217,000 miles. So suffice to say, a lot of the wearing faces and the tolerances inside the engine are not going to be the same tightness as they were before, basically. Things are going to be a little bit more sloppy a little bit more worn out as you'd expect so I think the 5W40 will help compensate for that a little bit and ultimately I think it's probably just the right choice for the engine in the first place. Interestingly in the Australian market which I know is obviously a hotter market so they would run thicker oil anyway this is the standard oil spec for the TDV8. 
The Australians also luckily didn't get DPFs on their 4.4 TDV8s, lucky bastards. So for them, the high SAPS oil has always been the standard go-to oil. It would be interesting to compare longevity of TDV8 engines here in the UK and in Europe versus over there in Australia and to see if there's any difference in engine wear over high mileages. But anyway, I'm blathering a lot too much right now. We need to get this oil out, change the filter and put the new 5W40 oil in there and see how the TDV8 likes it. Let's pack on. Now I've never actually used this bottom oil drain point on the TDV8. I've only ever used the suction port from above. But as I don't have my suction pump here today, we're going to be using this guy. There's no preference really, you can use either. I find using the pump is a lot easier. Um, less faffing around, getting underneath the vehicle. But let's see if I can do this without getting oil in my face. Knocking the camera over again. There it goes. I'm just using the uh, quick connect to direct the oil downwards. I'm worried it's going to shoot off to the right otherwise. And I don't have my big special socket down here in Kent unfortunately, so it's back to the old fashioned way of doing things. Should really get a socket and keep it in the car. Hopefully you guys can hear that trickle. When you release the oil filter, it actually releases a little bit more oil from this housing as well. So you need to make sure you don't reconnect the uh, sump plug or the hose in this case before you've taken off the oil filter. changing this every time that you do a filter change is probably a little bit excessive, but it's always good practice. Okay, let's whack it back on the car. So I've reconnected the pipe underneath in case you guys are wondering. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and put the first five liters in again without even thinking about it, because we could take at least eight liters. <clears throat> it's gonna be interesting if I notice any difference in um, sound of the engine. Um, in theory, it might be a bit quieter, less clattery. Not that it's very clattery anyway, but it might be interesting to see if I notice any difference. And also fuel economy. I'm hoping that the, the changes I've, I've done today, including cleaning out that manifold and the inlet there and making sure that all, I've got no boost leaks. Hopefully that's going to improve my fuel economy a little bit, but this may have a, a negative effect on the fuel economy, so it may balance itself out overall. And then we're going to use the handy dandy sight on the front of this just to put in another three litres. Uh, Actually, we'll go three and a half litres first. Every other time I've done it, it's been about eight and a half litres total for a complete um, correct oil level, so I'm pretty confident to just go with that. Got to love the sound of a happy TDV8 chuntering away. Because it's been running nicely for 10 minutes, we're going to go switch her off and then get an oil reading from the onboard display. So switch off. Nice bit of turbo flutter. And then we'll go ignition on. Clearing out all these messages. Okay, and then 
into the menu, service menu, oil level display, and it's gonna say not available. So what we do now is press cancel twice on there. It's sort of underfilled actually, okay, so interesting. So it's on the level there, it's on the min, so we need to add a little bit more. So we'll add another half a litre and then come back and check it again. Head into the service menu, oil level display, oil level okay. Okay, so we're two bars away from the top, which is about perfect. Because when the oil gets hot, obviously, that level's gonna increase slightly and when it's very cold, it's gonna decrease slightly. So that's about perfect. Okay, let's go for a little bit of a spin. Make sure everything's all right after a bit of work we've done there. So, yeah. Sounding nice and smooth as ever. Just gotta make sure I don't drive down the pit and we'll be good to go. We go straight back. I've left off the under tray at the moment um, so I can check for leaks and stuff when I get back. Um, but we'll put that on when we get back. So straight back we go. Okay, off we go. <coughs> so what have we done in all that work? Well, initially I just wanted to sort that belt that was squealing on startup and it seems like we've done that so far um, it will remain to be seen whether that belt continues to uh, wear okay and whether it starts to wear out quickly again like the last one did but hopefully uh, adjusting the alternator and reseating all of those pulleys has sorted the issue out and as well as that I cleaned out that inlet manifold thoroughly removed about probably half a kilo of congealed muck and crap from the inlet cleaned out the throttle body uh, resealed that inlet manifold um, cup on the front with those new o-rings that you guys saw fixed a definite boost leak on one of the couplers uh, where it was also causing an oil leak to run down the back of the engine hopefully i showed you guys that on the video but that's solved as well now and we've just put some nice fresh 5w40 a4b3 uh, engine oil in so that should be lovely and smooth and keeping the engine nice and protected over the next whatever it is six to seven thousand miles that i do between my oil changes so I'm very happy with that. That's a lovely interim service that should mean I can keep running the Range Rover for a good while yet before I have to do any more in-depth work on the engine. As I said to you guys before, at some point in the future, I do want to have an engine out job on this car where I'm going to go through everything, timing chains, all that kind of thing, turbos, and do a complete refresh. But for now, it's running absolutely beautifully. <coughs> the TDV8 is pulling nice and strong here from very low RPM up this long steep hill, um, running absolutely perfectly. I have to say, it definitely feels a bit more responsive low down than it did before, more eager to pull away and eager to pull up the rev range. Um, and that's probably because all the boost that the turbo is making is actually making it into the engine now, as opposed to leaking out through various uh, leaky joints, things like that. And also that clean inlet manifold has got to be helping. I definitely want to clean the actual inlet manifolds as well, one on each bank, um, as I really made um, as I made the bad mistake of looking inside them whilst the inlet donut was off, and it's not not a pleasant sight in there, unfortunately. <clears throat> but for now, a definite improvement, and should keep the TDV8 going for a good while yet. <clears throat> Setting the camera up in the car here just reminded me actually, somebody did mention to me I should do a POV uh, kind of video, driving video of the 4.4 TDV8 where I'm not talking, just kind of doing a video to kind of showcase what it's like to drive one of these cars. Um, I know a lot of people that want to buy one of these cars um, are kind of hesitate, they um and are about uh, buying them and I think maybe a POV video might help um, people to realise what it's like to actually drive one of these things. So just pulling onto the main road here, I'll just give it a bit of a squirt. It's sounding lovely, pulling lovely, absolutely no problem at all getting up to the national speed limit and beyond there. And as I say, it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that MPG figure 
on the dash and see if it has any effect over the next few thousand miles um, from changing the engine oil and cleaning out that inlet manifold. Anyway guys, that wraps up my first video of Sam's Motor Machine for 2024. Uh, we've got the Range Rover in ship shape condition, ready for a few more mods, which is gonna be the theme of the next couple of videos at least. Um, so stay tuned for them. Make sure you hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. Check out my Patreon, which I, have to, I do have one, uh, although we've only got a few Patreon members on there. Um, it's very nice to be able to interact with you guys on a different platform, provide behind the scenes uh, content, and uh, I can even have one-to-one -one conversations with people on there as well. So if you do feel like joining and supporting the channel, that'd be much appreciated. And I've also got a Teespring account that you guys can go onto and buy yourself some sounds motor and machine, not like this. Um, head over there, I've got some cool designs on there that you guys might enjoy. Anyway, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you next time. Cheers!